This is episode six of our 2023 Stamp Chat series. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. We're going to pause just a little longer while we let folks in the Zoom door. We have a very busy October coming up ahead. If you're, um, we'll describe that at the end of the end of the presentation. But tonight we are very fortunate to have with us Dr. Frederick Lawrence. He is joining us for his third Stamp Chat. Um, at least, I may have missed one, but uh, he is coming from Gilbert, Arizona to join us. And his presentation tonight is titled Researching a Covers Story. Those of you who have been at Stamp Chats before uh, saw these maybe in 2020 or 2021 knows um, know his content areas as uh, Maffa King and the Blueprints. Tonight he's gonna to talk about those covers and how he got to that story. This is his perspective on the life of a cover. And in his own words, and maybe you'll hear them again tonight, he likes to say every stamp, every cover in our collections and in our exhibits has a story and how it came to be in our temporary possession and who owned it before us and where it's been and when it was there. Uh, just a little bit about Dr. Lawrence first, sorry, FRPSL, try to get that right, is an international award-winning exhibitor, judge, consultant, columnist and all around scouting on stamps expert. He's been a collector exhibitor and researcher of scouts and scouting on stamps since 1960, the year he earned his Boy Scout stamp collecting merit badge. Hope I got that right. During the 60s and 70s, he formed one of the most complete collections of scouts and guides on stamps in existence at the time. And in 1989, he exhibited competitively for the first time. You can correct me on any of this later. We're almost there. His exhibit scouting on stamps classics has won top awards at the national and international levels and is one of the first to successfully present the classical period issues of modern topical of a modern topical and traditional philately form. He's done extensive philatelic and historical research on all three of the scouts on stamps classics issues and the postal history of Mafeking and authors numerous col columns, excuse me, including the classics corner and the modern era corner for the SOSSI journal and fakes, forgeries, and facsimiles for forerunners. Is an APS accredited and U.S. national level judge, qualified in U.S., U.N., British South Africa, Czechoslovakia, Thailand, Aerophilately, and Thematics Topicals. What a mouthful. An APS accredited chief judge and an FIP accredited international level judge, qualified in the traditional class. He has served as a U.S. Commissioner for an International Philatelic Exhibition and as awards chairman, exhibits chairman, society's liaison, and jury coordinator for U.S. national level World Series of Philately qualifying show. Professionally, he holds a Ph.D. in industrial engineering, engineering statistics, and operations research, and is presently a consultant to industry and a college-level educator. He won the Institute of Industrial and Systems Engineering's 1996 Pritzker Award and is a retired U.S. Air Force officer, having served for 23 years in a variety of assignments in the research, development, acquisition, and operation of military space systems. Okay, how about that? Now, just a quick technical note here for those of you watching the presentation live, your microphone and camera are disabled during the presentation. Uh, this allows um, technology to focus on, on the presentation. To engage fellow attendees, please make comments in the chat section. And if you have questions, please use the question box and we'll get to those questions at the end of the presentation. If you're watching this as a recording later, please feel free to ask questions in the comments section. We'll get to those later. This program is provided thanks to generous support to the generous support of APS members. If you're not already a member of the APS or would like more information about our services, please visit our website at stamps.org. Dr. Lawrence, welcome back to Stamp Chat, and thanks so much for being here and sharing your time with us. This is the Zoom floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eric, for your more than generous introduction. And good evening, everyone, and welcome to this APS Stamp Chat on researching a cover story. My objective tonight is to share some philatelic research methods, tools, and techniques by illustrating their application to the development of the life story or the history of a candidate cover. 
This is the candidate cover. Some of you will recognize the franking. It's a block of four of the three pence small format Baden-Powell head Mafeking Siege photographic or blueprint stamps. Especially if you participated in my stamp chat in late 2020 on the Mafeking Siege blueprint stamps. But if you didn't, no worries, as we'll begin with a background of the Mafeking Blues. The Second Anglo-Boer War was fought between the British and the Boers, descendants of Dutch settlers, for control of land in what is now South Africa from 1899 through 1902. The small town of Mafeking was besieged by the Boers at the start of the conflict because Mafeking occupied a strategic position on the north-south rail line that ran from Cape Town at the southern tip of South Africa to Bulawayu. More about what that is and where it was in just a moment. And <clears throat> there was a railway repair facility at Mafeking that maintained both locomotives and rolling stock. And by besieging Mafeking, the Boers cut rail traffic on that north-south rail line and denied access to the railway repair facility. The siege lasted from late October of 1899 to May of 1900. In anticipation of the outbreak of the war, the War Department in Great Britain assigned Colonel Robert Stevenson Smith Baden-Powell to be the commander of the garrison at Mafeking to defend it if it were to be besieged. Baden-Powell later went on to become Lord Baden-Powell of Gilwell for his work as the founder of the World Scouting Movement. Now, at the start of the siege, the army took over postal operations in Mafeking. All able-bodied men were pressed into the defense of the town, and teenage boys were organized to deliver the mail on bicycles. The army bought and then surcharged all stamps in the post office to new values to pay the rates during the emergency postal operations during the siege. When the surcharge stamps were exhausted, they produced some local stamps, three stamps in two designs. A one penny stamp in the middle on the left with Cadet Sergeant Major Warner Goodyear, the leader of the Cadet Bicycle Corps, the teenage boys who delivered the mail on bicycles during the siege and then two three-pence stamps featuring Baden-Powell, just in different sizes, small and large. Using the ferroprussiate or blueprint process that was used to produce architectural and engineering blueprints at the time. And today, the stamps are referred to as the Mafeking Blues. So here again is our candidate cover, and again, the franking, a block of four of the three pence small Baden-Powell head Mafeking Siege photographic or blueprint stamps or Mafeking Blues. We'll develop the life story or the history of this cover by asking a series of questions and then researching the answers to those questions. When we're done, the consolidated answers to those questions will tell us everything we ever wanted to know about this cover. First question, where did the cover enter the mail? In the Mafeking post office. Now, during the siege, the Boers shelled Mafeking with artillery daily except on Sunday. So critical functions were relocated underground in bunkers that were called dugouts at the time. This photograph shows the entrance to the post office dugout. It's just a wooden A-frame covered with corrugated metal sheeting to protect it against cannon shells. On the left is J.V. Hobart, the 
Maffey King Postmaster, and on the right, Cadet Sergeant Major Warner Goodyear, again, the leader of the Cadet Bicycle Corps. The photograph was taken by E.J. Ross on the left, a professional photographer who volunteered to remain in Maffey King during the siege to take advantage of it for commercial purposes. After the siege, he published a collection of his photographs in a booklet, Siege Views of Maffa King, in the lower right. He also took the photograph that was used for the Baden-Powell head blue stamp, and you can see a crop version of that photograph in the upper left-hand corner of the front cover of his booklet. When was the cover posted in Maffa King? The answer to this question is considerably more difficult than it might appear on the surface. The postmark appears to be April the 1st of 1900, but this is an impossible date for the small format Baden-Powell head stamp. Here's why. The Saturday, April the 7th issue of the Maverick King Mail special seed slip contained this notice from the postmaster. The new issue of stamp bearing the colonel's photograph will be produced on Monday, the 9th instant. These stamps can only be issued on production of letter addressed locally, Maffa King or Forts, referring to the defensive fortifications that surrounded Maffa King in a ring. No person can for the present be allowed to hand to the officer in charge of siege post office, that would be HOAT, more than one letter per diem. So April the 9th is the official first day of issue of the small format Baden-Powell head. And for 79 years, April the 7th, the day of the announcement in the Mavic King Mail, was considered the unofficial day of issue. But then in 1979, the first April the 6th usage was recognized. The image you see on this slide is that stamp, the first to have been recognized in 79. It was originally thought to be missing a digit, so April the 16th or April the 26th. However, it was certified by the expert committee of the Royal Philatelic Society of London in 1980 for the date April the 6th. And today, at least five examples are reported. Now, the April the 6th date was determined through a study of the spacings in the 25 millimeter Maffa King circular date stamp or cancel. The spacings between AP and a single digit day date on the left and the spacings between AP and the first and second digits of a two digit day date on the right. All of this appeared in the autumn 1983 and spring 1984 issues of the Anglo-Boer War Philatelist, the Anglo-Boer Philatelic Society Journal, the covers of which I show at the bottom of the slides here. Now, what does all of that have to do with the candidate cover? Well, the study on the spacings of the Maffa King Cancel showed that the April the 1st was really a cancel error for April the 11th. So on the morning of April the 11th, when the day date in the cancel was changed, it was initially misset as April the 1st. A small number of items were canceled before the error was recognized and then corrected. There are four covers known with this April the 1st for April the 11th cancel error, our candidate cover being one of those. At the bottom of this slide is a stamp canceled April the 11th after the error was corrected. And curiously, it is from sheet position 11 on the sheet of 12, which has the so-called ball flaw or bullseye uh, <clears throat> error 
or variety that you see just above the second one of 11. A small piece of dirt or a cinder intruded on the emulsion on the glass plate negative used to produce the stamps with the ferroprussiate process, and then light refracting over that piece of debris resulted in the ring or the halo that you see around the center of the flaw. Where was the cover addressed? What we saw was addressed to Bulawayu, Rhodesia. This is an internet image of Bulawayo, circle 1900, probably looking south down Main Street with the majority of the town to the right or the east of this street. We'll see a map in a minute. Bulawayu was at that time located in territory controlled by the British South Africa Corporation, which was owned and managed by the English millionaire Cecil Rhodes, after whom Rhodesia was named. That area became Rhodesia and is today Zimbabwe. Mafeking was located in the northwest corner of the British Cape of Good Hope colony. The name Mafeking is the original anglicization of the actual African native name of the town. It was later changed to Mafeking and then more recently to Mahikang, which is the name of the town today. Again, all to reflect more closely the African native name of the town. The red line shows the portion of that north-south rail line from Cape Town to Bulawayu that connected Mafeking and Bulawayu. That line today continues to the northwest to Victoria Falls. Note the position and location of Botswana on this map. We'll have recourse to that in just a moment. Now, how was the cover carried to Bulawayu? Mafeking siege mail was smuggled out through the Boer War siege lines by African natives called Kaffirs, and the mail so carried is today referred to as Kaffir grams. The Kaffirs followed the route of the 1888 Mafeking to Gu Bulawayu, that's what Bulawayu was called in the 1888, Gubula Wayu, a runner post. This post operated before that section of the north-south rail line that we just saw connected Mafeking and Bulawayu. The illustration here of an Afri African Kaffir letter carrier shown carrying a message in a cleft stick is from the illustrated London News as it appears on the AGE Photostock website. This is a copy written image, which I use under the fair use policy for educational and research purposes. Now in 1972, Botswana, remember that was the British protectorate, British Bechuana Land Protectorate in 1900, Botswana issued a set of four stamps and a souvenir sheet commemorating that 1888 Mafeking to Gubulawayu runner post. We see here the souvenir sheet that shows what the route of the runner post was, which is essentially the route followed by the Kaffir runners in smuggling mail out of Mafeking in 1900. Then in 1988, they issued four more stamps and another souvenir sheet with a revised route based on some historical research done in the interim. When the Kaffir runners arrived at the British lines, mail was turned over to the Army Post Office system, which transported the mail to an Army railway mail car, which sat on a siding at the Army base camp just outside Bulawayu. 
I've not been able to locate a photograph of what the Army railway mail car would have looked like during the Boer War. However, this is an internet photo of the later post office railway mail car from 1904, just two years after the end of the Boer War. So I'm pretty sure that the Army railway mail car looked pretty much like this in 1900. There were personnel from three different organizations in the Army railway mail car. There were soldiers who worked for the Army post office, postal workers from the Bulawayu post office who checked incoming covers from Mafeking to ensure that the franking met the established postage rates, and civilian censors employed by the Army to check all mail incoming and outgoing. Once a cover passed the censor review, it was then transported to the Bulawayu post office. The internet photograph is the Bulawayo post office circa 1900, though not dated. The monument you see on the left is to the 1893 Matabili Rebellion, which was put down successfully by the British. There's also a car between the monument and the building, which is helpful in dating the photograph. How was the cover franked? Well, the rates for the Kaffir grams were, per half ounce, six pence when carried south via Kimberley. That's the subject of another discussion on another night. And one shilling when carried north via Bulawayu. Now, although the route to the north via Bulawayu was more expensive, it was actually safer than the route to the south via Kimberley for reasons that are not well understood today. So the franking on our candidate cover was four times three pence or 12 pence, which was one shilling. Now to put that in modern terms, that would have been about 27 cents US in 1900, and adjusted for inflation today, about $6.50 US. Now, USPS priority mail flat rate for a legal envelope is today $9.95 US. So at about $6.50 US, a Kaffir gram was about two-thirds the cost of a priority mail flat rate legal envelope today. So a, a real bargain at just 12 pence or one shilling. How was the cover marked at Bulawayu? As I said, when a cover entered the Army Railway mail car, it was first checked by a representative of the Bulawayu Post Office to ensure that the franking met the proper postage rate. Sometimes the covers were annotated on the front to reflect the rate and then initialed by the postal worker, but not always. This cover was, unfortunately for us today, not so marked. Then the cover was passed to a civilian press censor who opened the cover, examined the content, and if the content was not suspect or improper, marked the envelope with the violet hand stamp past press sensor. Then the covers moved forward to the Bulawayu post office for local delivery or onward transport, which would have been to London for delivery to addresses in the UK. At the Bulawayu post office, the covers were backstamped. The backstamp here is faint, but with the help of side lighting and a magnifier, um, it can be seen to be Bulawayu, Rhodesia, 25 April, 1900, 11 to 12 a.m. We'll come back to the inverted manuscript annotations in the upper right of the corner in a couple of minutes.
Now, how might the cover have been check marked if it had been marked? This is another of the Mafeking Siege covers uh, franked in part with blueprint stamps. Here we have a vertical pair of the large format Baden Powell head stamps, uh, a very rare franking. The checking mark is located below the six pence siege surcharge stamp. That's right here in blue pencil. A little hard to read, but the mark is one followed by a diagonal or forward slash and then a dash. That indicates that the postage rate was one shilling and no pence. Then the initials of the post office employee who checked the cover. J.H.P. Those are the initials of John H. Powell, the Bulawayo postmaster. So sometimes Powell himself worked in the Army Railway mail car and checked incoming Mafeking siege covers. There are five sets of initials for other postal workers plus Powell's initials that are known. The image is blurry, and I do apologize for that. It is from the back cover of the dust jacket of the catalog of Sotheby's auction of the Sir Maxwell Joseph collection held in October of 1982. The dust jacket was printed on paper, and then the paper was covered with a plastic cover, or plasticized, much like a lamination of a COVID-19 a shot card or something like that uh, today. So the scan is through the plasticized paper, which distorts the image slightly. And again, I do apologize for that. But I wanted you to see what a checking mark might have looked like if our candidate cover had been so marked. Who was the addressee? Well, here's where we don't know as much as we would like to know. On the cover, the address is Jones and Arkwright, 12th Avenue, Bulawayo. I've had little success in locating information about the layout of Bulawayo in 1900 and the businesses that operated there. The website Bulawayo Memories has this layout due to Fletcher of Bulawayo from June 1984 and a copy of Davis's Bulawayo director for 1895 to 1896. At that time, the businesses were located along the north-south Main Street that we saw in that photograph a few slides back and on the avenues first through sixth, all north of the Market Square. There were no businesses to the south of Market Square at that time. However, about five years later, 1900, Jones and Arkwright was a business located on 12th Avenue, about six blocks south of Market Square. Bulawayo had expanded so much in the interim. What business was at Jones and Arkwright, I don't yet know. I suspect that additional information is located in the National Archives of Zimbabwe, which are today located in Bulawayo. The image is from the website of the archives. And on that website, there is a link to webmail through which you can submit questions to the archives. I haven't received an answer to any of the questions that I've submitted there. The economic and political situation in Zimbabwe is such that I don't think it's a very attractive place to consider visiting. Going back to Fletcher's layout map just for a moment, the grid pattern on the right was the British South Africa Corporation business area. And my suspicion is that the Army base camp located outside of Bulawayo at the time of the Boer War was in this area marked Government Reserve. 
we don't know who saved the cover at Jones and Arkwright, nor do we know who, when, and how the cover was brought out of South Africa. We can only ask when and where did the cover next appear. The answer is in late 1900 or early 1901. The cover appeared at Debenham Store and Sons, an auction house located in the Covent Garden District of London. This is an 1860 image of that business from Arcaseek.com. That website suggests that the building was essentially unchanged for the next 40 years and that it would have looked like this in 1900. Who bought the cover at the auction? Answer, J.R.F. Turner. Now, Turner, in the 1890s, was a collector of private English college stamps and envelopes. Private English colleges had their own local post systems and issued their own stamps and special envelopes for those local post systems, and Turner was an aficionado of this area of philately. These are uh, internet images of a college envelope addressed to J.R.F. Turner and marked received 1 December 1893 in his own handwriting. The description says that this is an 1886 private college envelope from Kebble, K-E-B-L-E, pardon my pronunciation. The content survives, and we can see it on the right. Dear sir, I enclose check for one pound sterling. I like the stamps very much on inspection, no doubt referring to some private English college stamps. I hope you have the envelope all right. That would be this 1886 Keble College private envelope, which probably was considered quite a rare item by 1893. Turner wrote rather extensively on the private English college stamps and envelopes. And you see a short bibliography in the blue box at the bottom of the slide. When and why Turner became interested in the philately of the Mafeking siege, I don't yet know. However, the London philatelist of November 1900 reported that, in a response to an article that appeared in the German philatelic publication Der Philatelist, Turner wrote, quote, I have in my possession upwards of 50 letters franked between 200 and 300 stamps that went through the siege to either Bulawayu or the United Kingdom, unquote. Then, the London philatelist in May of 1901 reported that on April the 26th, 1901, Turner read a paper at the Philatelic Society of London, that is today the Royal Philatelic Society of London. Reading a paper at the Royal involves giving a talk or a lecture and displaying philatelic material in frames attached to the walls of the meeting room. Turner displayed 10 covers, quote, franked wholly or in part with Baden-Powell's, unquote. Now today, only four of these covers are reported, including our candidate cover uh, and the example of the checkmark cover with the vertical pair of large format Baden-Powell heads. Two other covers are reported and the other six uh, haven't been reported since the London philatelist in the early 1900s. Turner went on to state that he bought the candidate cover at a sale at Debenham Store and Sons Auction House, but he did not say one. But that had to have been in late 1900 or early 1901 because he showed it at the Royal in April of 1901. Who owned the cover next? 
was James Ludovic Lindsay, the 26th Earl of Crawford, a famous British astronomer, politician, ornithologist, bibliophile, and philatelist. In fact, Crawford's philatelic library was considered the most complete. He had almost all the books, newsletters, journals, and price lists that had been published in the philatelic sector at the time of his death. His library was donated to the British Library in London. It has been digitized and is available online through the Global Philatelic Library, which you can access through the American Philatelic Research Library, APRL, which you can access through the APS website. So you can see everything that is in the Crawford Library today physically in the British Library in London. What we don't know is when and through what intermediary Crawford bought the cover from J.R.F. Turner. But it ended up in Crawford's collection. Who bought the Crawford collection? Answer, W.H. Peckett, a London dealer in rare stamps. The London philatelist reported in March 1912, I quote the entire report because I can't summarize it any better than it was written then. To Mr. W. H. Peckett has fallen the privilege of making this record purchase of the collections of the Earl of Crawford. The more remarkable, as we have reason to believe, that the entire amount was a cash transaction. By the purchase of the Crawford collection, in addition to the holding of an extremely valuable and extensive stock, Mr. Pickett today indubitably holds the most valuable stock of stamps of any dealer in the world. The image of Pickett is from the website thephilately.com, and the name thephilately.com appears in triplicate on the website. Or maybe that's an anomaly of my Google Chrome browser. I'm not sure. Continuing with the London Philatelist report, Quote, this vast transaction redounds, have to like that English word, redounds, greatly to the credit of Mr. Peckett, who thereby becomes the holder of an unrivaled stock of stamps among the most prominent countries we may cite. A list follows, including Mafeking, a superb lot, including all varieties unused, even in blocks and on entires many of these stamps being of the greatest rarity unused. Our candidate cover was among the entires that Peckett bought from the Earl of Crawford. In researching Peckett, I came across this on eBay, Peckett's pocket perforation gauge, which he either sold or more likely gave away as an advertising promotion to his customers. I didn't buy it, but I was really excited to see it. Who bought the cover from Peckett? It was Dr. H. L. Clark, an American zoologist who was a faculty member at Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts, keep Cambridge in mind, from 1905 to 1927. One of the manuscript annotations upside down as we saw it a few slides ago on the back of the cover is in clark's own handwriting collection of h l clark when the current owner of the cover bought it more about that in a minute a part of peckett's letter to clark was glued to the back of the cover I am also sending you a separate block of four Mafeking, Baden-Powell used on entire original envelope, and it may interest you to know that this comes out of the Earl of Crawford's collection. The prices are, in all cases, subject to a discount of 10%. Now notice that when the fragment was cut so that it would fit on the back of the cover, the last three letters of the word collection were cut off, and then they were written in I-O-N, 
by Clark in a different color ink than the person signing for Peckett. Clark also added that the letter came from London on January 18th of 1930. And again, that's his handwriting, the same as the annotation on the back of the cover, collection of H.L. Clark. Now, the Earl of Crawford's collection were so large that Peckett didn't offer this cover for sale until January of 1913, almost a year after he bought the collections in early 1912. In researching H.L. Clark, I came across this cover on eBay, addressed to Clark at his residence in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Remember, he was a faculty member at Harvard, and Harvard is located in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Also of interest to stamp collectors is that this cover originated with the New England Stamp Company. Now, the New England Stamp Company was formed in 1893, coincidentally the same year as the Matabele Rebellion, though I think completely coincidentally, in Boston. And the company did business in Boston until the early 1960s, when the owners at that time relocated it to Naples, Florida, in a storefront stamp shop. So it was one of the few storefront stamp shops that survived the closures in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. I recently looked at the website and unfortunately, the website says today that the store is temporarily closed. And let's hope we haven't lost that as one of the few remaining storefront stamp stores. Then, who owned the cover next? It was Dr. Stephen G. Rich. Rich was the son of Joseph S. Rich, who helped found the Collectors Club of New York and both the father and the son were actively involved with the Collectors Club of New York. The son's most widely regarded collection was his Orange Free State, Boer War, and Cape of Good Hope triangulars. On the basis of that collection, he wrote the book, Philately of the Anglo-Boer War of 1899-1902, in 1943. On the back of the cover, he wrote, bought by S.G. Rich, April 11 of 38. Coincidentally, he bought the cover exactly 38 years later to the day. Remember, the cover was posted on April 11 of 1900. But Rich did not know this, because at that time, the work to understand the April the 1st for April 11th cancel error had not been completed. That was only in the early 1980s. Here's the front cover of that book, Philately of the Anglo-Boer War, and the candidate cover is illustrated twice in this book, but the cancel date is misdescribed as missing digit, and Rich never knew that it was a cancel error. Rich died in 1958, but his estate held his stamp collections for the next 23 years until 1981. Now, in researching Rich, I did find on eBay this cover sent by him, perhaps a philatelic correspondence to a friend. Rich was living in Verona, New Jersey at the time, and that's located at the Red Star here on the map insert. It's just northwest of New York City, which is the square with the black dot here. And Rich commuted from Verona to work in New York City in the 1950s, when I suspect that compute was far more manageable than it is today when you think about the traffic in and out of New York City. Then in 1981, his estate sold his philatelic collections 
through the Scott Auction Galleries in New York City. This auction was the last auction of the Scott Auction Galleries, which went out of business shortly thereafter. This is the front cover of the auction catalog from October of 1981, and we see our candidate cover depicted. This photograph shows what the cover looked like at that time. As we can see, it was opened across the top. That happened in the Army Railway mail car when a civil censor opened the envelope to inspect the contents in late April of 1900. However, when the cover was purchased by the current owner, the letter fragment glued to the back of the cover had caused the cover and the letter fragment to warp and endangered the continued well-being of the cover. So the current owner had the letter fragment removed by an archival restorer. And in the process of removing the letter fragment glued to the back of the envelope, the flap also came off. So following the industry convention of paper archival restoration, the restorer reattached the envelope flap using a Japanese paper mending technique to the top of the envelope. And we see the cover today with the flap restored across the top. When the current owner exhibits this cover competitively, he notes that the envelope has been restored. That's acceptable because neither the stamps nor the marks, the cancel and pass press sensor, uh, and the address were affected by the restoration. However, you and I might not undertake such a restoration just to improve the look of a cover that had been opened raggedly at the top. However, in this case, because the flap fell off when the fragment of the letter from Peckett to Clark was removed, there was no choice except to restore the flap. Now, you might think that we now know just about everything about the candidate cover, but you just never know when you'll see a candidate cover. Now, this is the first page of a four-page ad flyer from the 1980s from Collector's Mail Auctions, a business in South Africa. The catch line is, the world's rarest stamp is not for sale. Then, when you open the flyer, it says, but thousands of stamps are for sale in our auction. And on the front cover of the flyer, we see some rare stamps illustrated. In particular, US number one, the five cent Franklin in the very scarce orange brown shade, if the color of the printing is to be believed. Among the covers, there's an Israel first cover, first coins, high values, tab singles on a first day cover, clearly lot number 138 in some auction, and an image of our candidate cover. Notice it has the black border around it, so this was lifted from the Scott Auction Gallery's catalog of the sale in October of 1981. So Collector's Mail offered never had this cover on consignment and never sold it, though I'm sure that they wish they would have. So wrapping things up, there's the almost complete life story of a candidate cover, and research continues to fill in the gaps, as I mentioned. I really hope I shared with you some useful philatelic research methods, tools, and techniques through this presentation. And if I did, why not try your hand at researching the life story of one of your candidate covers? And if I can help you in any way, 
please feel free to contact me at the email here on the last slide or through Eric or Scott at the APS. And thank you everyone for attending this stamp chat. Good night. Thank you, Dr. Lawrence. Um, that is a that is a very fascinating talk. I uh, I have some of my own questions. I'm glad we have a few minutes to take a few others. Uh, I want to start with uh, a comment that was made fairly early in the chat. That uh, it's kind of fun when you were comparing uh, early on the April one, April eleven cancel cancellation of post. Um, you you were there was a lot of detail to that. Someone suggested that maybe that was an early April Fool's joke. And is is there any history of that kind of thing that's gone on in the cloudy world? So yeah, and I, I I may dig a hole for myself here, um, but yes, that that is a plausible explanation because there are some blueprint stamps that are canceled with the date February 30th, which of course is an impossible date as well, since there is never a February 30th, uh, and the blueprint stamps did not appear until early April. So the February 30th cancel are certainly favor cancels. So were they done as a joke, or were they done from someone who just wanted to have a blueprint stamp with an impossible date? We don't know. So could April the 1st have been done on April the 1st as an April Fool's joke? We can't know for sure. Now, what has happened, though, is that the four covers that are now known with the April the 1st for April 11th cancel, quote, error slash joke, unquote, have become quite valuable by virtue of the date not being a possible date, but being considered to have probably been the result of a cancel error. Thank you. Thank you for answering that. That was actually meant to be playful, but there was a real serious answer behind that. Another question that came in, this is from... Okay, better, I'm hoping. Sorry for that, folks. Um, Evan Siegling asked, um, I was under the impression that kafir was a derogatory term. Uh, was that true back in 1900? Or is it still true? An answer to that in the order in that Van asks, uh, no, in 1900, it was not considered a derogatory term. However, today it is considered a derogatory term to describe Native African peoples, just like the N-word is today considered a derogatory term to describe uh, African Americans in the United States. So everyone, please be careful when using the term kafir, uh, that everyone understands that you're using it in a historical uh, and or research connotation. So Kaffir Runner Post and Kaffir Grams are part of the story of the Second Anglo Boer War, but otherwise you would not use that term today. Thank you. I appreciate that answer. I'm sure Van does as well. Sorry for the extra letter. Um, we have a request for you to repost your email address, please. When you get a chance, we'll send it out to participants as well. Um, I have a couple questions as, as well. I'm, I'm new to a lot of this. Is it standard, I know you said earlier in your talk and you repeated a few times, for the military to take, take over postal operations during wartime or is that specific to regimes, particular wars, particular countries? Is that a standard practice? I think you have to look at the countries involved, the uh, the particular conflicts and and the time frames. Um, but for the British, uh, the answer would be yes. So if you look across British Commonwealth philately, uh, you see a number of issues that were o overprinted during uh, other conflicts, not just British Commonwealth stamps, but local stamps that were overprinted for use by British forces. Uh, when they entered conflict zones. So uh, not unusual for the British to have done this in the 1800s and into the 1900s, no. In one of your early pictures, you also showed uh, there was the bunker and the opening to the to the postal 
operations, the kind of the underground. Yeah, to um, the bunker or the dugout, as it was yes. called at that time. The I think the cadet there was Cadet Goodyear. I don't remember his first yes. or middle name. Is that related to the to the Goodyear family corporation that we now know? Do we know that? Um, to the best of my knowledge, no. Uh, we do know something a about Warner Goodyear and uh, his family in the UK, but I've not seen anything that uh, ties him to the Goodyear family uh, in, in America. Uh, an interesting short story about him was that uh, his grave was uh, lost for some time. A and then a few years ago, Perhaps the uh, best collector, the most knowledgeable collector of Mafeking siege material, John Ineson, who resides in, in the UK, was on one of his uh, trips to South Africa, and he located Warner Goodyear's grave, which is not outside of Mafeking, but it is elsewhere where some others from the Boer War conflict were buried. And there's a story that he can tell you as to how he came about to find that grave. And he paid out of his own pocket for a marker to be erected there that uh, identifies Warner Goodyear as being the cadet sergeant major who led the cadet bicycle corps during the Mafeking siege. We we are getting close to eight o'clock and we try to stay tight on that ending uh, we may be able, depending on your answer to this question, we may be able to fit one more in. But I'm wondering, are there still questions that you to, to to which you are seeking answers relative to this set of covers and these this philatelic material? Well, absolutely. With respect to this particular cover, uh, I'd like to know, for example, what business was Jones and Arkwright on 12th Avenue in Bulawayo in 1900? Who saved this envelope? Who at Jones and Arkwright saved the envelope? Who transported the envelope when and how out of South Africa to the auction company where we saw it in either late 1900 or early 1901, having been purchased by Turner? And it would be nice also to know who the intermediary was when Turner sold the envelope to the Earl of Crawford. I only found out through uh, a member of the Royal uh, whom I, I contacted uh, just on the outside chance that he, not knowing who I was or am, might be sufficiently interested in my question to read my email. And that person then told me all about the sale of the Crawford collection by W.H. Peckett. I would not have known as much as I do about that had it not been for information given to me by a member of the Royal Philatelic Society of London. I have subsequently asked, does anyone know about the sale of this cover from Turner to Lord Crawford? And the answer at the moment is, uh, no one who's knowledgeable ab about the philatelic trade at that time uh, n n knows more. So someday we may find out more about this cover. Uh, but then again, those answers may have been lost to history. It's the fun. It's the effort to try to squeeze out, to eke out, you know, one more shard of information to fill in. The story is not complete, but it's quite intriguing as far as I'm concerned, and I'm not going to give up on it. That, to me, that uh, that really defines philatelic research and a lot of what, a lot of the activity that philately drives is that kind of curiosity and closing those gaps. I'm going to fit in one last question that came in just at the end here from Joseph um, Bowling. Sorry if I've got that wrong. Are any of the stamps watermarked? Um, as the blue one pound notes are. And then we'll wrap this up after <clears throat> your, your answer. Uh, the, answer the answer is uh, yes. The stamps uh, were were made uh, on a uh, on paper that had uh, a watermark, one watermark in the center of the paper. Uh, the watermark was Oceana, 
O C E A N E with O capitalized and Sienna lowercase letters, and then the word fine, F I N E, referring to the grade of the paper in all capital letters. So one time in the center of this larger than A4 size paper that was available uh, from the same printer who did the Mafeking mail, by the way, the watermark appeared one time. So finding stamps with watermark letters, part watermark letters, or complete watermark letters is a real challenge. Dr. Freund, an expert in the Mafeking stamps in the 40s and the 50s, wrote that he thinks 8% of the blueprint stamps have part or full letters on them. I myself have been trying to complete that watermark with full letters or near full letters. I started in 1986 buying the first stamp with a watermark letter at Ameripex in Chicago in 1986, and I'm still working on it. Now you can buy complete watermark reconstructions in the auctions, and I haven't done that. Again, it, it's the it, it's the fun of the search, the hunt uh, for for these stamps. I still have two letters that I haven't found nearly complete or complete. And I look at every blueprint stamp in every dealer stock at every stamp show I go to, and you can do the math how many years it's been since '86 when I started with that reconstruction. There are three sheets, so uh, of the one penny, the cyclist, three plates, and reconstructing the 36 plates based on the Liechtenstein notes took only a couple of years. Again, just doing it from scratch for the fun of it, because you can buy those reconstructed sheets or plates in, in the auctions as, as well. But the watermark, that's a significant challenge. I'm glad to know that the hunt continues for you. It sounds like it's part of the a, a, a significant part of the, the the process for you. Thank you so very much, Dr. Lawrence, for sharing your expertise with us, for doing another a third one of these. Maybe when you you uh, finish the hunt or complete more of the hunt, there'll be another stamp chat in the in the queue for you. Um, I want to thank um, APS members again for their support for stamp chats. Scott, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, before we go, I want to just point out that we've got stamp chats going on every Tuesday in October, starting with the third. So this is next week. And we have Greg Galetti presenting next week, who will talk about UN Expo and some behind the scenes, um, uh, his expertise with UN Philately. Um, he will have a guest with him as well. Uh, and October 10th, we two weeks from now, our very own Ken Martin will present a Stamp Collecting 101 presentation, uh, part one of that, um, set up for uh, beginning collectors. Uh, we're putting some energy into that. So if you know a beginning collector, someone who's new to the hobby, please invite them to any and all of those. And um, uh, thank you again. Uh, we will have this posted uh, within a day or two here. And if you have any additional questions, get in touch with uh, myself, um, eric at stamps.org or um, Dr. Lawrence directly. Thanks very much. Have a great evening. And I think your cat wants your attention, Dr. Lawrence, so you will be attacked by the, uh, soon. Thanks. Thank you. Good night.